How have you been? Good, man. Good. Uh, I've just been, you know, it, it, what's really hard is the last two weeks have been moving uh, country and, um, and that, that time of not being at the computer and working is really frustrating. <laughs> I, I didn't realize how much of a workaholic I was because it was like, uh, it was stressful not being able to, to beaver away and build. Um, but yeah, apart from that, uh, now, now I've got my desk, I've got this beautiful, uh, uh standing desk now, sitting standing desk. So I'm ready to roll again and I'm back at my good spot. <laughs> there you go. You know, it's always bittersweet, right? When you, when you take time off, because on one hand you kind of need that space and time away, but on the second part of that, you almost have this uh, sense of anxiety of everything that you need to do while you're away, uh, especially yeah. if you've got, you know, a, a ton of stuff to get to, um, which, you know, everyone's talking about it being a bear market and uh, things are kind of quiet and boring on the market side. But I tell you, the industry folks are super busy. Like I go to conferences, everyone's busy. Everyone's building mm. relationships, mm. collaborating, uh, focused on the tech. Uh, what's been mm. keeping you busy right now? Well, yeah, and just to add to that quickly, um, you know, the, the bear markets are really where where the the crappy projects get weeded out because they they didn't plan properly or they you know they're not uh, or or the scams just aren't there as prevalent and um, <clears throat> and really as an as a person that's looking as a as someone that's looking for deals in the space, this is the time when it's boring. This is the time to find those good projects because it allows you uh, to to basically not have these massive hype trains that fog reason um, uh, because, you know, we, we're all human. And when 50 humans are going, oh, this project, you, you tend to be a bit more like, oh, yeah, I've got it. Whereas that shouldn't be how it goes. It should be like, where's the hole in the market? What's needed? What's a problem that needs to be solved? And, oh, look, these people are beavering away, building something really interesting that's solving a problem that I think will be quite big. Plus, wow, it's probably at a cheap rate right now because the markets are bare. So now's the time to actually accumulate. Uh, it's not, you know, the bull markets are times to, to watch the what you've accumulated rise. Uh, hopefully but really I, I you know bear markets are interesting like that and it's and it's funny in, with investments i see it all the time where people are like, ah, crypto nah it's over uh. but then if, if if something's on sale like a pair of jeans they're like oh i've got to buy those jeans they're on sale 50 percent off of course i had to buy it whereas with crypto it's like something might be 50% down and they're like, Oh no, Oh, it's just down. It's dead. It's down. It's like, it, it's a total different mentality, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, do you feel like for those folks that are in the industry, uh, building does, does the same stay true for them as it does for investors? Like is now a good time, the best time to build? Um, it, it's a very hard time to raise capital. Um, and that's that's the only thing for builders. If you can have enough capital to basically just start and build an MVP, then it's a good time if it's something that's uh, not needed. But <clears throat> if you're raising capital either from the crowd or a VC, uh, I find that the bear markets are, are, are harder. Of course, if you've already had a good exit somewhere along the line in your career, then you've probably got connections with, with capital that will make it easier. But if you're a fresh uh, a kid from uni that's that's building something really cool, it's, it, it will be harder in the bear market to find capital. And it really goes to show like, you know, a lot of people think that VCs are the smart money, you know, but man, they are just as dumb as the a lot of, you know, not all VCs, but a lot of VCs are just as sort of follow the crowd mentality as, as retail investors. Um, you know, as soon as there's a bull market, they're all jumping on everything, not even looking at the pitch deck. Oh, he invested, so why I will? Or, you know, it's it's um, it's really interesting this because I always grew up thinking VCs are really intelligent. They really fine comb everything, and and uh, it's not like that at all. And a lot of family offices get uh, who are the people that feed money to VCs get get bitten by <laughs> by. Uh, 
bad VCs. Yeah. But yeah. More and more VCs that I talk to, I feel like it's more about the team than it is about the tech. I mean, don't get me wrong. The, the, the tech is very important, but mm. uh, a lot of times, uh, these VCs are look, are investing in the actual team, the, the chemistry of the team. Uh, I know some folks that they went to school together, they grew up together, and you know that team chemistry is going to be solid. Yeah. They did a good job of, of raising funds in the previous bull market, but I feel like that's half the battle, right? Yeah, it's it's as an investor, if I put my investor hat on, it it's definitely... A, a part of the puzzle of the team but you can't be all team because then you head towards nepotism which inevitably happens as well meaning you just sort of invest in people that you know and a lot of the time you don't know the best of the best maybe you do you're, then you're lucky but um it's about really split it's the same when you hire as a, as a builder when you're hiring other talent to join the team you have to be able to see uh very clearly the person, the type of person, the skill set, but also are they, are they kind? Are they nice? Are they, are they good people? Um, you know, and all of this is a, it's, it's one of these, it's a, it's a, it's a dark art, isn't it? <laughs> Trying to figure out like a person that you don't really know, but you need to feel that vibe. And that's where I think this human intuition still comes in a little bit, you know? Um, yeah. But uh, that, that's, I, I think the tech, also plays a very very important role so it's it's a it's a balancing act like they've got to be solving an idea and they've got to have the right team and it's got to be the right time yeah yeah well you certainly understand the importance of building relationships you know just recently i was on your show for international DeFi day huh. That was quite a uh, an event that you and your team put on. I mean, that was amazing. You had high caliber professionals in the industry coming on and uh, everybody was sharing about their project. How has that event translated to meaningful relationships for you? Well, it was, um, you know, like there's these little subtle things of respect as well for, uh, you know, if, if you invite someone on and they're, they're, they're nice to you or they come on time, uh, like little things like that. But also just the fact that um, uh, people would come on and and share what they're doing. Uh, and I think this is, sorry, my, I've got a new puppy here. <laughs> it's grabbing bits of paper. Oh. You know, the last episode I did <laughs> uh, with, with Kobe, he had his uh, cat. <laughs> which attacked yeah. his desk. So listen, bring on the animals, all of them. Bring on. All. <laughs> <Aussie ones. laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this one here is a, a, it's a, a little, a fresh little doby. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It looks like a troublemaker, cute dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, what, what, what were we saying? Uh, oh, yeah, how did it change? Well, you know, they, they came, uh, it was... When we started, uh, I, I started a startup called Voltoro, which was the very first Bitcoin exchange uh, to deal with physical gold and Bitcoin. Um, and I launched it in 2015 and uh, built it in 2014. And and uh, we got into the Techstars uh, Accelerator program, which is this large North American uh, accelerator. And one of the big things that they taught us there was give first, uh, the, the mentality of give first and, and meaning, you know, like you're doing, you're, you're, you're inviting other people in to talk about their projects and through that relationships start to build. Um, and I think it's, it's a really great mentality to have for any builder to, to go out there and, and help others first. And, and that's how you gain that network. Um, and, and I, I think, you know, international DeFi day was really about, for me, seeing um, BlockFi, seeing Celsius, seeing um, th these centralized authorities and, and FTX, of course, basically stealing uh, billions of money through either ineptness or uh, bad, badly run companies or straight out scams, um, that we need to head more towards DeFi. We need the, the true regulator... And, you know, FTX, for instance, FTX was highly regulated. It wasn't like it was operating in a, in a totally unregulated market. It was highly regulated. 
And so the, if a scammer wants to scam, they just go around the regulations. They say yes to the regulator. They show the regulator what they want to see. You can't do that with DeFi. With true DeFi, you write the regulations in math and the math sits there and it's readable by people like yourself and companies like Certec uh, who will then translate it to readable English for uh, the consumer and say, this is what the regulations say in this smart contract. Take it or leave it. And, and that's why I really wanted to take that moment to celebrate DeFi. Um, and, you know, to all my Bitcoin Maxi friends who, uh, you know, who, who go on about like, oh, it's a scam coins, everything on Ethereum's a scam. And like Ethereum allowed for the first time to have a true decentralized exchange, what Uniswap had built uh, to, to uh, rethink the order book. Uh, and, and develop these liquidity pools, it was absolutely extraordinary. And it was really the birthing of getting away from centralized authorities. And this was the whole point of Bitcoin in the first place. And Bitcoin serves a great purposes and, and, and it was my first love. So I always, you know, it's always up there. But we shouldn't look at other technologies and put it down because there are scams in there. I mean, gold's been around for 5,000 years. There's this infinite amount of scams running on the gold uh, stack, you know, <laughs> uh, so to speak. And so, yeah, like International DeFi Day was really all about celebrating all things DeFi, uh, all things, getting, getting things back to smart contracts rather than, uh, you know, obviously maybe there's regulation, human regulations might play a part of the puzzle here as well but the main the main thing that i see stopping scams is education teaching people the things like what you're doing here is teaching people what to look out for how to how to spot things that might not be kosher and then uh and then secondly the, the math you know the having actual regulation hard coded two plus two two is always four it's it's never five and uh, and that's that's why it's just so powerful. Uh, I want to challenge you on something for a moment. So when it comes to uh, DeFi, you know, obviously a lot of this is ran on smart contracts, and uh, on the security side, every once in a while you find that there are you know certain privileges that are not renounced. So there are certain centralized components. Do you still consider that to be? DeFi. I mean, how yeah. do you view that? Uh, absolutely. It's 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 something that I've struggled with a lot, especially you know running a, a centralized exchange for so long. Um, how did we never get hacked at that centralized exchange? You know, how did we launch in 2015? Still going today, and never had a hack yet. Every day they're trying all around the world these these hackers, and basically it was secrecy. <laughs> you know, it was like. We don't, nothing is told, like it, everything is a small team. And that's one profile you can use. The other profile is fully open source and letting thousands of people try to penetrate, um, which is, I think, a more advanced level. But to go from the mentality of a centralized exchange to a full open DAO is really hard. So first of all, switching that mentality. Second of all, absolutely. But decentralized, uh, what you said is 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 absolutely true. It's there's there's hardly any DAOs that I could say are truly decentralized, but it is a scale. So if there is, um, you know, some would some would say that that Bitcoin is more decentralized than Ethereum, but it it's kind of like how, how can you quantify that? You know, well, you can look at miners and see how central, centralized these pools are and how many pools there are. Well, with Bitcoin, there's not that many pools. It's like eight pools and four of them control the vast majority. Um, with with Ethereum, it's now through this, the, the proof of stake, it's more exchanges that are, that are the pools. So uh, that's fairly centralized. With DAOs, on the DAO front, you have the treasury, which is the centralizing component of apart from like upgradability and things like that, where you can push an upgrade to a contract uh, that, uh, you know, but usually even an upgrade to a contract, usually best practices would be that the user has to then switch to the new contract because you can't change the old one that easily. I mean, maybe you could, you, you'd be better off knowing about that. But, um, 
But I feel like, uh, for instance, our smart vaults on the standard, if people lock up funds into those smart vaults and borrow against them, um, if, if we upgrade to a new smart vault with new functionality, uh, people need to actually uh, sign a transaction to move that debt over to the new vault contract. So there's, there's a bit of, uh, you know, I, I, we as a, as a group of developers can't just push something onto everybody instantly. Well, I hope uh, that's the, that should be the case for most uh, contracts. But also treasury, I think, is a big one. How do you, as the team, step away and allow the DAO? There's great, great steps forward, like with OSNAP, for a, a lot easier to control multi-sig uh, safes with, uh, with the vote of of the crowd so people can start to put uh proposals forward have a vote and then the vote if it triggers yes will trigger the sm the, the multi-sig um, so that the founders can start to move away and start to autonomize it because the whole autonomous organization part <laughs> for true decentralization needs to be autonomous and i don't see that many that have that have gone the full autonomy route it's certainly uh, difficult to add. Uh, I mean, with that in mind, do you think that there is a place for centralized applications where maybe perhaps they're a little bit more user friendly? And for that reason, they act as a gateway into crypto? Or do you believe that we can uh, reach a place where we can have full decentralization without compromising the user experience? Um, I, I think we can, but it's a long way off. We're a very long way off. And the, the, the biggest issue is that it just takes one project to get big and then make a bad decision. Uh, for instance, uh, USDC, big project, is fairly, is, let, let's leave the, centra, that the fact that it's centralized stablecoin out. But they launched on Arbitrum rather than making it uh, taking time to write a contract where bridged Ar Arbitrum uh, becomes fungible uh, with natively minted Arbitrum, uh, sorry, bridged USDC becomes fungible with natively minted USDC. Um, it's now this like on Arbitrum, you've got USDC.e, which is bridged Arbitrum from Ethereum. And then you've got USDC, which is natively minted uh, as the ticker symbol. And that, that sort of stuff is just so confusing to people. And, and without solving some of these like core uh, Wild West style decision making that's out there, I think we're going to find it hard to get grandma friendliness into, uh, into the, to the truly decentralized space. And, you know, there is always going to be a spot for the coin bases of the world because they focus on absolute ease of use and you know this goes to the 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 uh dichotomy of security versus speed and ease right um it's kind of and and anyone that's tried to secure their own keys knows that well it takes it that there's like if you're if you're building an offline wallet uh with an air gap and and all of the good stuff there where you're generating the seed really uh with with as much entropy as possible. If you um, screw that up, A, then you've lost your tokens. If you um, make it too complex and give it a year and your fallible human brain forgets how you rest to restructure what you've set up because you've made it too good, then you lose your coins. So that whereas the ease of use on a centralized thing where you allow somebody else to deal with all those hassles is I think always going to be there, unfortunately. Uh, so while we can strive towards decentralization, which is the the absolute goal for, for myself personally, and and I know for a lot of other projects, um, there, there is I, I, I'm not going to be deluded and say Coinbase should go away, like it's terrible. It's not. It serves a purpose. It helps people um, that are technically. Uh, uh, ready or aren't emotionally ready enough to deal with those butterflies in the stomach every time they, they, they click the send button. Did I do it right? Oh, yeah, I did it right. Okay, I can see it on the chain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, speaking about uh, decentralization, when I was at Permissionless, uh, there's a gentleman, 
we got to talking and turns out he, uh, he works for the IRS. And then he asked me a very interesting question. He said, why do people here care so much about decentralization? So I'd about to ask you that question. Um, well, if you look through history at the banking sector, uh, it, it has gone, uh, humans have a really great knack of finding ways of feathering their own nests over other people so that they'll, they'll and, and then banking families and private families have really, uh, found a way to make things that don't make too much economical sense. Uh, legal, like fractional reserve uh, systems, and and then get in get very comfortable in the corridors of power to uh, moat themselves through regulations. Uh, so you can have bad. Uh, when I say corrupt, I don't mean corrupt people. I mean just a corrupt system, where the system just long term like. Uh, you could say musical chairs is a corrupt game you know, in the same manner. Like there's not enough chairs for everybody. So the system just breaks. There's, someone fails. Someone, someone drops out all the time. So, so in that way, um, the, the fractional reserve system is just a corrupt system where you, you, you cannot, uh, you start to enrich others and you can, and, and then you can create wealth out of nowhere, uh, ask interest for that wealth that you've created out of nowhere. And just like Terra Luna, who created wealth out of nowhere, um, eventually it'll fail. And, and so the trouble with centralization is that you, gain, uh, you get the ability for a, for a megalomaniac to take control of a certain power structure, whether that's a financial power structure or whatever it is, and and tilt it towards their own um, benefit rather than the benefit of who you know we the people or you know I don't want to sound too like too commie or anything like that but you know you you want to try and uh, help as many people as possible having the best system in a society uh, for for money so I find decentralization in terms of money is a great way to separate money and state because state is fundamentally that centralization force and. Uh, the state has jumped in bed with private actors in the banking sector sector to um, to create federal uh, reserve systems globally, and so by decentralizing that, I feel that we can uh, remove that centralized uh, uh, problem. And so that's on the that's on the massive uh, macro, but if you if you zoom into um, something like FTX, you know we've seen multiple cases of of fraud and of um, problems with centralized authorities. Now, some would say, well, we've seen many smart contracts being hacked or rug pulled and all the rest of it. So it's definitely not a panacea, but I think it's it's the right way to go um, moving forward. And it's, and it's a combination, like we said earlier, about education, but educating the consumer, uh, as well as great uh, services like Certec delivers with auditing and, and structuring, uh, as well as other, other auditing companies. And, and uh, yeah, and, and, you know, uh, just time, time to, for the, for people to understand uh, this technology a little bit more and make it more, more user friendly. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned USDC earlier in the conversation and you also touched on Terra Luna. So if, both have their limitations clearly with Terra Luna. Uh, where do you feel like, what is the right solution for a stable coin? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm biased here, but I feel that we've really gone towards trying to build the better solution. Um, I, I don't like the fact that, you know, Terra Luna talked about capital efficiency, like, oh, we, we can now, no one needs to lock up funds to, create a stable coin. So that's very capital efficient. But when it crashed and, and burnt billions of dollars, th that's very capital inefficient. <laughs> you know, you've destroyed so much value. So uh, my my perfect, uh, so I, I look back at the gold standard 
at the first thing. I, I don't actually think that's the perfect way because now you've got a centralized authority holding a bunch of gold and issuing debt on that gold as certificates. Um, whether that's a creditor lending it to the to the vaulting facility and the vaulting facility issuing a certificate or a, or a state um, that can say, well, this, this paper always redeems in gold. Either way, you're manipulating the price of gold by saying one paper is always equal one gram. So now you're sort of manipulating gold. So, and this is actually what caused a lot of, um, well, some could say the Great Depression is because there was no incentive for new miners to find new gold sources uh, because it was always going to equal one. There was no speculative uprise in gold. It was always going to equal one dollar. Um, so why look for more? Um, so, so the gold standard, while being good at, hey, you've got this real world asset, you've got this rare asset backing paper. So that side of it was great. But the other side wasn't. Uh, what uh, is really great about the crypto space and about the DeFi space is lock, allowing anybody, thousands, millions of people to lock up rare numbers rather than rare metals into uh, meaning Ethereum or, or ARB or LINK or, uh, you know, so, some of these blue chip proper tokens, Bitcoin, wrapped Bitcoin, of course, um, lock up that into a smart contract that they control, not a, not a central, not anybody else. They control that, lock it and start to create debt from that while leaving a buffer of collateral uh, uh, above that, I think is, I think is the closest to perfect money that I can think of. Because I I think Bitcoin is very close to perfect money apart from the fact that it's uh, highly volatile. But allowing you to lock up Bitcoin um, at like, you know, 150% collateral, let's say, and then issuing yourself, let's say you lock up 100 and you borrow 50 and you allow the, the volatility in there uh, through that over collateralization. Issuing that as debt and with the standards at zero percent interest, which then gets rid of the whole usury nonsense that we see in money creation, um, uh, is is for me really really close to perfect money. You have a stable currency. Yes, currently it's pegged to like U.S. dollar or U or euros or Indian rupee or you know other things. But I think we can go a step further and later on and say, well, we can peg this to like indices or uh, we can start to have money that's pegged to gold again, uh, but backed by rare, like crypto, rare crypto numbers. So, yeah, that that to me is the perfect, uh, the perfect money. I feel. And, and you mentioned that this is something that you're working on at the standard. Can you shed a little bit more light about what exactly is the standard? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? You mentioned that there are certain gaps in DeFi. And the right products and solutions will fill those gaps. Well, we'd love to learn yeah. a little bit more about what that is. Oh, great! Well, yeah. So, so the the standard came from initially where when I got asked because I ran this Bitcoin physical gold exchange. Many people were always confused as a tokenized gold, and it wasn't. It was just order. Uh, it was just allocated bullion sitting in a high security vaulting facility. It was fully insured, fully audited, but people would buy fractions of bars and uh, and then they could get it delivered out to them um, if they wanted to or they could if they bought the whole bar or they could um, convert it into anyway um i i got asked to give a talk at uh, la bitconf in 2019 about stable coins um and uh, because the gold wasn't tokenized but it was still stable that's the whole point of altoro it was like you didn't need. You could take profits and have it in something stable, even though it wasn't a token. And um, so I gave this talk and uh, basically warned people about uh, about centralized stablecoins and algorithmic stablecoins, saying that there's going to be a huge algorithmic stablecoin. It's going to get very big because it's it is it has got this air of capital efficiency, and then it's going to die because they always die. And it wasn't like I was had some magic ball or some sort of foresight. It was basically because I'd seen it before. I'd been in this industry for long enough. I'd seen bit shares from Dan Larimer collapse. I'd seen multiple tries of purely algorithmic stablecoins collapse and die. And it's and it sucks when it happens because it's it's a good enough dream, but it 
effectively doesn't work. So after that conference, I went home and started to really think about what the best stablecoin would be. And um, yeah, so like I said, the best stablecoin is allowing anybody to lock up their own crypto into a smart contract. They don't need to trust a central authority like a bank or BlockFi or anything, and then borrow uh, mint new stable coins from that value. So, but then the next thing was, okay, the, well, there's, there's already like Maker DAO out there doing this sort of thing. So how can we make that better? Well, I had a, a debt be liquidated uh, and I, I, w I felt so locked in. And we saw the problem with locking in things, uh, it, even with, well, someone could say this was the downfall of Celsius. They bought too much staked ETH, which was locked in. They couldn't, three hours capital locked in. They couldn't do anything with it. So as a borrower, it's very, very important to have some sort of um, flexibility with your collateral, even though it's locked. Yes, it might be locked. So with the standard, you can put um, Ethereum, wrapped Bitcoin, ARB, Link, and Pax Gold into a smart vault, one smart vault. So you can have a whole portfolio of different cryptos in one smart vault. Issue yourself debt. And let's say the market turns, you know, China bans crypto again. And uh, everything's bleeding uh, red in the market. Well, what, what might not be is tokenized gold because gold is, is still a rare asset, but it's sitting on a different train track. You know, we've all seen it. Bitcoin goes down, the whole market's red. Uh, Bitcoin goes up, the whole market's green, apart from the odd outliers, right? So being able to trade your locked collateral, uh, let's say you've got some ETH, it's going red, it's heading towards collateral, uh, like your vault being liquidated. You can take that and swap it uh, within the vault to tokenized um, gold. And then if the market turns and goes back green, you can trade it back into uh, that same amount of value back into like link or something that you feel is going to go up. The ability to sell debt and collateral, at, sell these smart vaults as an NFT. I was, um, you know, I, I was playing around with NFTs before they were called NFTs. That they were they were called colored coins on Bitcoin years ago, um, and we were, we were you have throwing around ideas in the community about uh, how you could use these products in finance, as well as like using door locks and stuff like that, like other things. With the standard, what happens is when you lock up funds into a smart vault, that smart vault issues a dynamic NFT. And the dynamic NFT basically has um, is an SVG file. So it's not a pixel file. And it pulls data from the blockchain in real time um, and displays it in the image. So it'll display in the image like, okay, this person's got one ETH locked up, uh, 0.5 ARB and, and whatever else, and tell you the euro value for the euro vault. And, and then tell you how much debt has been taken out against that. And um, and then you can actually just sell that uh, to somebody and someone can buy that debt and collateral, pay off the debt and remove the collateral that's worth more. So it's a great way of, let's say you've taken out a huge debt, uh, you've bought a car, you've lost your job, you've got a bunch of collateral sitting in there, uh, and you, but you need you need liquidity. You could just go onto OpenSea and sell that. Someone will buy it and give you some liquidity for that debt and collateral. So it was that's uh, also a really interesting use case. It, funny thing was we we developed this, and uh, and then I started. I, I read a blog post from someone at MetaMask who had been analyzing large hacks in the space, and it turned out that a lot of these OGs were getting uh, their seed phrases stolen. And the common denominator in all of that is they all had it in LastPass. And LastPass a year earlier had been hacked, which was a password management slash uh, data storage, encrypted storage space. And uh, they'd been hacked. And they said, oh, don't worry, every vault, uh, what the hacker got, these blobs of data are all encrypted. Um, but the only thing not encrypted was the email associated with that blob. So... The hackers have meanwhile been spear phishing uh, or basically been uh, looking for OGs in the space, in the crypto space, taking that blob of data and brute force cracking weaker passwords and uh, busting it open, stealing the funds. And so I thought, oh, you know, I have some test wallets that I had in LastPass. Let's, um, 
uh, that slowly over time test wallets become like real wallets you know because the value goes up and you know you keep on just using it and uh which is probably not a good idea but anyway uh i i thought uh, let's close some debts so i went over and, and i had to close a liquidity debt i closed a maker debt but it sucked because i had to pay off the debt at a loss because ethereum had gone down i was like oh i'm gonna pay off the debt all right and then I had to withdraw to another transaction to withdraw to my wallet. Then I had to move that wallet over to a new uncompromised seed, load it back up, rebar. It was a big hassle. I went over to the standard. <laughs> the dog's got. I went over to the standard. I have like 25 different vaults. I went over to, um, to OpenSea and select all of those NFTs and just sent them in one transaction all over to a new seed. And... And so that was just, for me, a beautiful use case of something that we hadn't designed for. But it was a great way to, if you feel your, your seed has been compromised or looked at, you don't need to go and close all your debts and repay them and do all this nonsense. You just send that debt to a new seed and, hey, presto, uh, you're secure again. So um, that, that's just a little bit of the standard. The, the last thing about the standard, apart from collateral management and these NFTs, is that we will uh, be releasing, um, uh, we started off with EuroS, which is a, a Euro-based stablecoin. And uh, next we'll be launching USDS for USD standard, and then Indian rupee, Great British pound, Canadian dollars, um, Australian dollars, and, and just going through the gamut uh, of the blue, the main fiat. So we really wanna build a decentralized stablecoin ecosystem uh, and hopefully build an effects market based on that um, that uh, will allow people to uh, start to deal with, you know, the effects market is literally the most liquid market in the world. So it, it's, it, it should definitely come all on chain as fast as possible, um, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, that's, that's what we're aiming towards. Amazing. Uh, being that you are working on a stable coin, there's obviously in Capitol Hill, a lot of conversations about the regulatory aspect in Europe, you have Mika, I believe, do you keep those things in mind as you're navigating these waters? Or do you feel like being that you're in DeFi, that's not something that you should really be concerned about? I spend a lot of time with regulators, with my centralized, uh, with the centralized exchange that uh, we built. And um, I think there's a definite need for regulators when it comes to centralized authorities uh, like FTX. They need, they, they need some sort of authority to say, look, if you mess around, you're going to go to prison. Um, or there's going to be some sort of, you know, uh, you know, if it's not prison, it's, uh, there has to be some rule set uh, that, uh, is good. Saying that, the gold industry is self-regulated in the UK um, by uh, a regulatory body that is um, non-enforcing. But it means that if you follow their rules, you can put the LGBT. Uh, sorry, not LGBT. The, uh, there's too many acronyms in the world. The uh, uh, London Bullion Market Association stamp um, onto your onto your product if you're dealing with gold right uh, you follow the rules and you can put that mark on your stamp so on your product uh, or service so um i do think there's a there's a case for regulation whether it's voluntary or not but when it comes to DeFi, like i said we're creating software that allow allows people to lock up their own assets and have full control of their own assets and then mint uh, from themselves mint a thing that happens to track um, uh, fiat currency. And so I, I feel like the true regulator, there's nothing really that regulators can do with that. What we can do is say, as an industry, we are only going to support, we're going to support um, projects that are truly uh, audited and and you know the best practices just like um the the uh, london bullion market association we should be focusing on a, a best practices for people to to go towards oh look make a dow is working on a thing they have um these best practices one bad thing is that they allow usdc to be a collateral so that's maybe uh something that, a tick or you know it's sort of 
because nothing's perfect in the space, but allowing a consumer to see and understand the risk profile of these projects is really important. And the true regulator, the true arbiter um, of, of rules should be, should be maths and should be the smart contract, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for sharing that, Josh. You know, there's uh, a lot of folks that are building in DeFi and many of them, most of them have really good intentions and uh, you know, many of them wouldn't even show their face, but you're, you're out there, you're showing your face, you're educating people. And I think that uh, the industry needs more people like that. So appreciate you uh, coming on. Uh, where can people follow along uh, your journey and the standard? Yeah, well, uh, just head over to thestandard.io and um, and you can also follow us on Twitter, uh, which is the standard underscore IO, like at the standard underscore IO. And me personally, I'm at J Shigala, which is <laughs> my name. So J S C I G A L A uh, on Twitter. And you can follow my mad ramblings on there uh, anytime. Wonderful. I'll, I'll be sure to include those links in the description. And uh, any parting thoughts for the listeners? No, I mean, uh, yeah, my parting thoughts is don't, don't get, uh, don't let the media, I, I know a few people just that missed out on Bitcoin, uh, because they listen to people saying, ah, oh, it's this, it's that, oh, it's made, it's for drug dealers, or it's for, you know, uh, just just negative, negative Nellies, just constantly saying bad stuff. Use your own mind, uh, look for actual problems being solved and look for good teams like we mentioned before and use this bear market for your advantage because bear markets are where you pick up, uh, you know, you, you buy when there's blood in the streets, as they say. <laughs> um, that is what they say for sure. Josh, this was a real pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing about the standard and just talking DeFi. It's always a, a pleasure to uh, connect with you. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you very much.